So let's go. So uh, I'm going to come back and share the screen again. So uh, here we go. We're back where we left off. Okay, everyone. So here we are again. And we're coming back to this uh, uh, sutta, the uh, Kaya Gata Sati Sutta, the mindfulness directed to the body. And we're going to finish this off and look at some of the uh, conclusion statements about the benefits of the sutta, the benefits of this kind of practice. Uh, so we'll just uh, carry on with some of these similes and see where this, this takes us. So, next simile. Suppose a water jar was placed on a stand, empty and hollow. Then a person comes along with a load of water. What do you think, monastics? Could that person pour water into the jar? Yes, sir. In the same way, when a mendicant has not developed or cultivated mindfulness of the body, Mara finds a vulnerability and gets hold of them. So um, this is kind of nice, yeah, this idea that you have is like a water jar. If it's empty, there's nothing inside, you can fill water into the jar. In a similar way, when you have developed your mindfulness and you are directing your mindfulness in the right way, it is as if you are complete, you are psychologically complete. There is no part of you, psychologically speaking, that is vulnerable or empty or hollow but you are full within yourself. Yeah, you feel a sense of completion within yourself. And this is one of the characteristics, for example, of uh, metta practice or karuna practice and these kind of things. Uh, if you have a very strong uh, loving kindness or compassion for the world, it's like you, are, you feel complete within. There is no gap. There is no uh, kind of sense of craving because there is a gap inside of you. Craving is always because we don't feel complete inside of us. So we crave things in the world. We go out into the world to fill that kind of gap that we feel within. So when we are have full mindfulness of the body or we have good metta practice or karuna practice, we feel complete. Yeah? It's not as if we, we don't need anything more to feel complete. It's the opposite of craving. Craving when we demand something more to fill us up. So when you have that need to be filled up by something outside, uh, that is when desire comes, that is when desire arises. Uh, this is ma why Mara has an opportunity when you don't feel that sense of psychological completion. Yeah? You are hollow inside, like this hollow vessel, uh, and that's why you have a problem here. Uh. But when a mendicant has developed and cultivated mindfulness of the body, Mara cannot find a vulnerability and doesn't get hold of them. Suppose a person were to throw a light ball of string on a door panel made entirely of heartwood. What do you think, mendicants? Would that light ball of string find an entry into that door panel made entirely of, heart, of hardwood? No, sir. In the same way, when a mendicant has developed and cultivated mindfulness of the body, Mara cannot find the vulnerability and doesn't get hold of them. It's again, it's this idea like you have armor outside of you. You have like a, a shield. Yeah, the shield is here, the shield of the hardwood, the door panel. And so Mara cannot penetrate. There is no way of getting access to you because you have this shield. And that is the fullness of the... Uh, the fullness of the mind, the mind is complete, there's nothing missing there. Uh, suppose there were a green, sappy log, then a person comes along with a drill stick, uh, thinking to light a fire and produce heat. Uh, what do you think, monastics? Uh, by drilling the stick against the green, sappy log on dry land far from water, would they light a fire and produce heat? Uh, no, sir. In the same way, when a mendicant has developed and cultivated mindfulness of the body, Mara cannot find the vulnerability and doesn't get hold of them. Yeah, it's kind of obvious, no heat can be produced. 
no desire can be produced, no ill will can be produced uh, because you are, uh, you, you have kind of dried out. It's almost as if all those uh, excess desires or whatever, they have been dried out of you. Uh, so there's no longer any access there. The flame cannot come. There can be no spark. Uh, there can be no agitation of the mind, like the flame and the spark of, of desire, etc. Uh, like we talked about before. Uh, Suppose a water jar was placed on the stand, full to the brim, so that a, a crow could drink from it. Then a person comes along with a load of water. What do you think, mendicants? Could that person pour water into the jar? No, sir. In the same way, when a mendicant has developed and cultivated mindfulness of the body, Mara cannot find the vulnerability and doesn't get hold of them. You are full within yourself. You don't have any needs. You don't have any lacks inside by which Mara can access you, by which Mara can uh, cause desire to arise. There's no need for you to have any desires anymore. Desires are completely abandoned. When a mendicant has developed and cultivated mindfulness of the body, they become capable of realizing anything that can be realized by insight to which they extend the mind in each and every case. Yeah, so this idea here is the idea that uh, uh, anything that can be realized by insight refers to everything on the Buddhist path. Uh, it refers to the deep insights of becoming an arahant, or we could say the four stages of awakening. Uh, it refers to the, which I'll see in a second, refers to the jhana stages. Uh, but it also referred to all the supernormal powers. Yeah? So if you want some kind of fancy supernormal power, then this can happen through this way. So if you fully cultivate the mindfulness of the body, then this is what's going to happen. Yeah? So this is what uh, comes next. Uh, first of all, a, a few similes. Uh, suppose a water jar was placed on the stand, uh, full to the brim, so a crow could drink from it. Uh, if a strong man was to pour it on any side, would water pour out? Yes, sir. In the same way, when a mendicant has developed and cultivated mindfulness of the body, they become capable of realizing anything that can be realized by insight to which they extend the mind in each and every case. So when the jar is full it is like it is overflowing yeah it is like it's almost as if the mind kind of is uh, already full in its own right uh, and it flows over into the world and it's capable of kind of, of grasping that larger reality which comes from deep insight and a deep understanding of what is going on uh, you're not limited to your yourself you kind of goes into the world in a very broad sense uh, Suppose there was a square walled lotus pond on level ground, full to the brim so a crow could drink from it. If a strong man was to open the wall on any side, would water pour out? Yes, sir. In the same way, when a mendicant has developed and cultivated mindfulness of the body, they become capable of realizing anything that can be realized by insight to which they extend the mind in each and every case. So the idea of the overflowing mind, the mind overflows and then it goes into the world and it stretches beyond kind of the ordinary experience that you may have. And then comes the last simile here, which is a, a kind of standard simile in the suttas, which is quite uh, maybe more, to my, to my mind, more meaningful in this case. Suppose a chariot stood harnessed to thoroughbreds at a level crossroads with a goad ready. Then a deft horse trainer, a master charioteer might mount the chariot, taking the reins in his right hand and the goad in the left. He would drive out and back wherever he wishes, whenever he wishes. In the same way, when a mendicant has developed and cultivated mindfulness of the body, they become capable of realizing anything that can be realized by insight to which they extend the mind in each and every case. 
So this is the idea that the mind becomes like your instrument. Uh, yeah, the mind becomes like this charioteer. Uh, as it says in the suttas, the mind becomes pliable and workable, uh, and you can use the mind in any way that uh, you, know, you wish. Uh, the mind is very sharp, it is very alert, uh, and whatever you say to the mind, the mind does just that. Uh, yeah, but if you are an ordinary person, uh, if you are not an Arya, if you're not an Arahant, uh, very often, whatever you want to do, you can't do it. Uh, if you tell your mind to have metta, the mind still doesn't have metta. Yeah, the mind still gets upset about things. Uh, if, you, if you want the mind not to think about anything, you say, be quiet in meditation. I don't want to think anything. Uh, still, the mind thinks things in meditation. Yeah. If you want to have no ill will, still you have ill will. If you don't want to have any desires, still you have desires. In other words, the mind is not under your control. The mind is flowing along according to causes and conditions. And this is such a big problem in life. Yeah, these causes and conditions that we talk about here, these are the habits that we have in our life. These are the ways we have been conditioned from previously in this life and maybe also previously in past lives and all of this conditioning all of the habits that we have this is what controls your mind this is what controls us this is what makes us do all of these kind of things and sometimes we are almost helpless yeah it is actually so hard to be able to control this because the habits are so strong yeah and there's almost nothing that we can do about it and this is one of the reasons why it is so important to have compassion for yourself. Every one of us, we need to have compassion for ourselves and also compassion for others because we are not really free. We are trapped by the habits of our mind. We are trapped by, as I like to say, our personality. Our personality is just a habit that has been formed from the past. And it's very hard to get out of those habits and get out of that personality. You cannot step out of your personality, right? If I tell you to step out of your personality, you think that I'm crazy because <laughs> it's impossible. Uh, but your personality, what is it? It is just the conditioning that comes from the past. Uh, it is not anything more than that. Uh, so we are trapped. Yeah? And so one of the things that we are trying to do on the Buddhist path uh, is to release that trap. Uh, to get out of the trap, to recondition ourselves, to stop all these conditionings from always uh, bullying us and forcing us around in various ways. Yeah? This is what the path, large part of the path is about. And one day you start to feel more mindful. And one of the qualities of the mindfulness, this is a quality that is mentioned very often in the suttas, it is said to be adipateya, and adipateya means like mindfulness is like, it is like a lord. It is a power that controls you. It's a controlling faculty. Yeah. So sati, sati adipateya means that you are controlled by mindfulness. So when mindfulness becomes very strong, yeah, when you are aware of what is happening around you, when you are aware of what is happening in your mind, when you speak, when you act, but especially in the mind, it means that you can change the direction. You can stop yourself from getting angry. You can stop yourself from having certain desires, yeah, because you can turn in time. And this is the power of sati. So once you start to have mindfulness, you start to get this uh, chariot. You start, to, you start to get the chariot under control, yeah. The chariot here in the simile is like your mind, yeah. Suppose the chariot, yeah, uh, is harnessed, you start to get control over that chariot. You start to be able to move it according to how you want to move it. You're holding the reins, you're holding the goad. You know how to drive the chariot. And then as you progress further in meditation, as you reach samadhi, your control of the mind is even more powerful. Yeah, it starts to become very powerful. And this other expression in the suttas is, is that you are samadhi adipateya. You are controlled through samadhi. Because samadhi means a mind which is very powerful. It is very present. It is very peaceful. And you have a feeling that you are in charge of your life. 
It's like you have the power inside, the energy inside, which enables you to take charge of your own life. So with every step on this path, the ability to control your own life, to feel in charge of yourself, increases and increases and increases. And this is one of the very beautiful things about the Buddhist path. And maybe it is a thing that people don't often quite understand, that ordinarily in our life, we are not really in charge. Yeah, we are being pushed around and bullied around by our habits coming from the past, by all the conditioning coming from the past. And it feels like your life is a little bit out of control. Yeah, your mind is so incredibly heavily conditioned. But then as you practice this path, as we give rise to all of these qualities, it is as if you become more independent. Yeah, you become more able to, to think and do and use the mind in the appropriate way. It's a beautiful aspect of this path. And uh, we don't, often we don't understand how dependent we are, how, how much we are a slave in our ordinary life uh, and how unfree we are. Uh, if you often, if we understood how unfree we are and how much we are of slaves, we would rebel. Yeah, we would leave the, we would start, get to a monastery and ordain straight away because we understand that the importance of getting out of this slavery, we are trapped in the world around us. It's a terrible situation to be in. So you develop all of these qualities. And as you develop them, you become more and more free. You become a master of your own destiny. You become a master of your own mind. You can turn your mind almost anywhere you want. And this is what is happening here. Yeah, you take the reins of the chariot. You take the reins of your mind. You direct the mind wherever you want to, want to go. You use the goad. The goad is like a... What is it, like a whip or something, or a, something you prick the horses with to make the horses go in the right way? And you make the chariot move as you wish. You take the mind to all of these incredible states that are possible to realize within the teachings. So you have foundation is there. You are ready to realize anything you want because your mind is incredibly powerful, especially if you have all the four jhanas. So let's have a look at these things that can be realized in this way once we have, once the chariot is ready and uh, the, um, we, we can use the chariot in the right way. So have a look at the outcome of this. And the Buddha says, you can expect 10 benefits when mindfulness of the body has been cultivated, developed and practiced made a vehicle and basis, kept up, consolidated, and properly implemented here. So uh, the, the idea here with this is simply that if you want to uh, develop mindfulness of the body, so it, re so it actually has all of these 10 benefits, uh, you have to really practice it fully. Yeah? Half measures are never gonna work. You have to take it all the way to the logical conclusion of the mindfulness of the body. So you have to really cultivate it all the way and only then does it actually have these benefits. It is not an easy kind of thing to do. It takes time, it needs a commitment in its practice and then it will have these benefits. So all of these words just mean that you're really putting it into practice 100%. So the first one is that you uh, pre prevail over desire and discontent uh, and you live having mastered desire and discontent uh, whenever they arise. So uh, uh, the idea here is that uh, if there is any discontent in your mind, yeah, any kind of desires, any problems in the mind, uh, you have full mastery of that. Uh, you know how to block it, you know how to stop it, you know how to deal with it before it becomes a problem. And this is the idea here, the first idea of the cultivation of the mindfulness of the body here. So it's a very, that's a very kind of basic idea or it seems like it is basic, but it is incredibly useful, yeah? Because very often in life, the problem in life is often that we are not, not quite content, yeah? feeling restless, not really knowing what to do with ourselves sometimes. Uh, we have this underlying desire, not really knowing what the problem is. Uh, 
There's a discontent, a dissatisfaction, that's sometimes a very hard to pin down. If you practice the mindfulness of the body, you lose that. You don't have that anymore. That is extraordinarily useful in its own right. It means that you're never really discontent. Yeah? It means that you're always, your mind is always directed in a positive way, feeling that you have a sense of purpose. Life has a sense of meaning. You're going in a certain direction. The second one here is that you prevail over fear and dread. You live having mastered fear and dread whenever that arises, whenever these things arise. So um, fear and dread, this is any kind of fear you may have in your life. Yeah, Let's say that you stay at Bodhinyana Monastery and they put you in the kuti far away in the forest and you can't see anyone. All you can hear is the sounds of the night, the rustling of the leaves, the kangaroo jumping outside of your kuti. And it's very scary when you hear a kangaroo. Sometimes the kangaroos, they walk. And when the kangaroo walks, it sounds exactly like a person. Yeah. So you think that is a person coming to your kuti. But no, it's just a kangaroo. And uh, it's very easy to get afraid. Yeah. One of the uh, remarkable things when you read the suttas, there's that sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya called the Fear and Dread Sutta. And in the sutta, the Buddha talks about his own practice before his awakening experience, uh, when he was still uh, like a bodhisattva or he was uh, trying to be, find awakening in his life. Uh, and this was the Buddha to be. This is, you know, the great spiritual master of human history. And he says, uh, when he was practicing alone in the forest, far away from human beings, uh, he too was experiencing this fear and dread. This is an almost like a natural, very natural human emotion to have when you are in a dangerous, what seems like a dangerous situation. So if you want to overcome that completely, mindfulness of the body is sufficient. Yeah, you are complete within yourself. You have a powerful mindfulness. Although these defilements cannot penetrate anymore, you have the armor around you and you're ready to deal with all of these kinds of things. You can endure cold, heat, hunger, and thirst. You can endure the touch of flies, mosquitoes, the touch of the wind, the sun, and reptiles or creeping animals. So maybe also insects as well. That was mentioned the other day. You can deal with rude and unwelcome speech. You can put up with physical pain, sharp, severe, acute, unpleasant, disagreeable, and life-threatening. Yeah, so you have incredible endurance uh, because your mind is very strong. Your mind is very clearly in the present. Uh, you don't uh, give rise to desires anymore. Uh, you see your body merely as a, a conglomeration of elements uh, and you have withdrawn an interest from the body because you're not really interested in the body. The body doesn't really, you're not really worried about the body anymore. Uh, and because you're not worried about the body, all of these things that we are seeing here, because they affect the body, you can just watch it as if it has nothing to do with you. Even physical pains, yeah, we all know how strong physical pains can be sometimes. There are certain things that you can have in life that give extremely strong physical pains, like kidney stones, yeah, or maybe some kind of uh, when you go to the dentist, sometimes if they drill down into the nerves or, or, or there are certain maybe childbirth, I don't know, there are many things that can be very, very painful in life. Uh, and yet all of these things you can deal with. Uh, you can just stand back, you can watch it uh, because you no longer have any interest in this. Uh, you can also deal with rude and unwelcome criticism. You know how to deal with uh, uh, other people in the world. That's kind of interesting here, yeah. It's almost as if that mindfulness enables you to control the mind regardless of what happens. So this is already incredibly useful. Yeah? If all of us were able to deal with life in this way, we would already be a long way on the path. We would already be incredibly, have incredibly good lives. If all of these things wasn't a problem anymore, boy, that's already incredibly useful. 
But of course, the results go far, far beyond this. And from now on, we come to the more profound aspects, the deeper aspects of the benefits of uh, mindfulness of the body. So let's have a look at some of those deeper aspects. You get the four jhanas, the four absorptions, blissful meditations in the present life that belong to the higher mind when they want, without trouble or difficulty. Yeah, so the jhanas become yours. And uh, of course, a very large part of the, of the reason why the jhanas become uh, accessible to you is because you have given up attachment to the body. Uh, the body is the biggest hindrance for, for attaining jhana states uh, because the body also includes the five senses. Uh, and that five sense world with the body, we are very attached to that. Uh, so by weakening that attachment, uh, by letting go of the whole world of the five senses, including the body, then samadhi becomes accessible. Samadhi is only difficult because we are holding on to the world of the five senses. And this is why it is often so useful to recollect this, to remember the downside of the world, to remember that the world is out of control, to remember that your body is in large part out of control. You don't know what's going to happen to the body next. You don't know what your next experience will be. And the more you access, the more understanding you gain of all of these things, the easier it is to enter samadhi and get the jhanas as a consequence. And this is where it really starts to become very interesting. Because if you can get access to the jhanas, if you can get access to samadhi, it means that you have a bliss, you have a happiness greater than you have ever, ever had in your entire life before. You are beyond the ordinary world. You enter a different reality that gives you access to something far, far superior to anything you ever had before. So this is where it gets really, really interesting and you really start to see the powerful benefits of uh, mindfulness gone to the body. But you will also notice here, I just want to maybe mention this in passing, is that once again, the jhanas are said to be the outcome, a benefit of the practices of mindfulness of the body. Yeah, And before the jhanas were included in the mindfulness of the body, it doesn't make any sense, right? It's it's as if the jhanas have been added to mindfulness of the body by mistake. These are the benefits. They are not the practices to be done. So again, it shows us that sometimes the suttas get a little bit, a few things have been added to the suttas that don't actually make sense. And sometimes we have to stand back a little bit and have a look at what actually is going on. Okay, let's go to the next one. They wield the many kinds of psychic powers, uh, multiplying themselves and becoming one again. Uh, they control the body as far as the Brahma world. So these are the many kinds of psychic powers. Uh, and it's actually quite a nice, a nice little uh, um, paragraph about the psychic powers. And let me just see if I can find all the psychic powers for you because it's kind of exciting to hear about the psychic powers. I kind of enjoy it myself sometimes. So let me just uh, see if I can bring up the, uh, the psychic powers for you. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be a little bit hard. Okay, let me just uh, see if I can remember them approximately what the psychic powers are. Yeah, so the psychic powers are uh, being, first of all, being one, you become many. Yeah, so you can multiply yourself into a thousand people and get a thousand bobbies. So imagine having a thousand bobbies. That would be <laughs> very interesting. But fortunately, there is, for, the good thing is that after being a thousand, you can become one again afterwards. So you don't become a thousand and then you are stuck with being a thousand. You can always come back again afterwards. That's kind of the good thing about it. And then it says you can walk through a wall. Yeah, you can walk through a rampart. A rampart are like the big... Uh, kind of wall, big kind of earth mounds you found around the cities in the old days to keep the enemies away. You can walk through a mountain, yeah, if you want to. You can walk through a mountain, imagine that. <laughs> you can walk on the water, yeah, this is all found in the suttas. You can walk on the water. So they say that Jesus Christ walked on the water, but the Buddhists 
walked on the water a long time before Jesus Christ. Yeah, we have this a long time before. Yeah. Maybe the story of Jesus Christ walking on the water, maybe it originates from the suttas. Yeah. Some people said that that story may originally have come from the suttas because the Buddhist we did it a long, long time before. Yeah. Anyway, you can fly through the air like a bird. Yeah, you hear this story sometimes, yeah. like levitation and flying through the air. Yeah. And then at the very end here comes this idea that you can control the body as far as the Brahma world. And the body here means, again, it doesn't mean the physical body because the physical body we have here cannot go to the Brahma world. What it means is that you can take yourself to the Brahma world and it may be an astral body or something like that. But somehow you can go to the Brahma world if you... Uh, if you want to and you want to hang out with Brahma for a while and say hello to Brahma. How are you, Brahma? How is it going? What are you up to these days? Yeah, you want to hang out with Brahma for a while? And Brahma will say, yeah, these days I'm practicing loving kindness. I used to practice compassion. Now I'm practicing loving kindness. How are you going? Oh, yeah, I'm doing mindfulness of the body. <laughs> Maybe that's what happens in the Brahma world. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's stop there. Let's I apologize, I'm just drinking a bit of coffee because uh, coffee is really good when you have to talk a lot. Huh? So, so this is really... So there you are. So this is for my benefit, but also for your benefit because then we can, uh, we can be more sharp, especially after the meal. It's nice to have a bit of coffee so you can have a bit more sharpness. Uh, anyway, so you, you wield the many kinds of psychic power. This is called a benefit here. I'm not sure exactly why this is beneficial. I guess it means you can uh, do all kinds of weird things. It, it's kind of cool, right? Uh, these kind of psychic powers. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why they're called benefits here, but never mind. It's still uh, interesting at the very least. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Uh, with clear audience that is purified and superhuman, you can hear both kinds of sound human and divine, whether near or far. So you can hear things, yeah, maybe because your mind is very broad, you can maybe send your mind out, and then you can hear things far away. You can hear the devas, when the devas go chatting to each other, you can see what the devas are talking about. What do you think the devas are talking about? What do you think, anything? Do you think there's anything interesting? Are they talking about Dhamma? Or are they talking about sensual pleasures? Or are they talking about God? Are they talking, what are they talking about? Do you think the devas? <laughs> and I think, you know what the answer is? I think the answer is they are pretty much like human beings. Yeah, the devas, they will talk about just like us. The majority will talk about indulging in sensual pleasures. Oh, the deva world is so wonderful. Have you tried this latest ambrosia, the latest food of the devas? Yeah, have you all, how many, and I'm sure in Devaloka, you have all of these uh, nymphs, yeah, you have a thousand wives, and maybe if you're a woman, you have a thousand husbands, I don't know if that's the case, so you have all of this excess of everything, yeah, and everything is very beautiful and powerful, so you become very indulgent as a devas, I'm sure they talk about sensual pleasures a lot, but then uh, the devas are also spiritual yeah there are some of the devas are buddhist so they will talk about the suttas and they will discuss how to be kind just like we are doing now you find this in deva loka as well and then you find devas who are christians yeah and maybe the christian devas they will maybe pray to god just like we are praying to god or some people are praying to god anyway maybe there are some muslim devas and maybe there are some atheist devas all kinds of devas just like the human realm. It's just a more glorified uh, way of existing, but basically they are the same as human beings. So when you hear the devas talking, after a while you think, oh, this is really boring, just like hearing the humans, okay, enough. I'm not interested in this anymore. And then you go to the next superpower after that, because that superpower becomes boring. And the next one is you understand the mind of others beings and individuals, having comprehended them with your own mind. So you can read the minds of others. And uh, uh, I don't know if that is uh, good or bad. 
I think if you are a teacher, if you're going to teach others, then maybe being able to read someone's mind can be very handy because then you can help them maybe or guide them in the right way. But uh, if you are an ordinary human and you start to read other people's minds, uh, I think it is terrible. Yeah, it is like uh, there's so much junk that people think. So when you kind of hear other people thinking, you think, oh, no, I really don't want to hear this because... Uh, just like our minds, yeah? if you look at your own mind, uh, would you like to have your content of your own mind broadcast to the whole world? Uh, would you like everyone in the world to know exactly what you are thinking? That would be scary, right? Imagine if you had like this screen above your head and every thought you have gets written on the screen so the whole world can read exactly what you're thinking. That would be kind of scary, right? I wouldn't want that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be too much. Of course, when you live with Ajahn Brahm, you can never be entirely sure if someone is reading your mind or not. But uh, well, still, it is not the kind of nice thing. And because most people are like this, and many people are worse than us. They have even worse thoughts than we have. Yeah, Maybe they think about murdering others or stealing and all kinds of nasty things. I don't know. Actually, reading people's minds is not very interesting. It's only nice if you have to be a teacher and you have to teach others. So, so uh, anyway, but it's possible according to the, to the Buddhism. And uh, one of the interesting things about reading people's minds is that there are many ways of doing this. Yeah, And the suttas talk about four different ways of reading someone's mind. And the most simple way of reading someone's mind is just to observe that person. And if you observe a person carefully, you can tell largely what the content of their mind is. Yeah. If someone is kind of really rushing around and you can look at the face and you know straight away this person is angry. Yeah. Because they have a frown on their face. This the kind of the way they're behaving. They don't even have to talk. You know straight away. Yeah? Or if someone is very calm and they have a big smile on the face, you feel a sense of metta, maybe a sense of kindness being present in this person. Yeah. So a lot we can tell just by looking at the person. We can actually know the content of the minds. So we are all mind readers in a certain way, yeah, because we're always guessing the content of other people's mind through their conduct. So it's already happening to some extent. Anyway, it is possible to do. I guess this is the main point here. And now come the really interesting ones. These are the ones that really matter. And these are the things that have real spiritual significance. Yeah, you can recall the many kinds of past lives with all the features and details. And this is incredibly important and incredibly useful because when you recall the past lives, that is when you start to understand the idea of dukkha. You start to understand suffering here yeah? because suffering really is expressed yeah, in this way, in this kind of eternal round, going around and around, going from one life to the next one. Huh? So this is incredibly powerful. Huh? So if you can recall your past lives, and you can do that because of your contemplation of the body huh, or mindfulness directed to the body, then you have an inc incredibly powerful way of understanding the Dhamma. This is really understanding the Dhamma in a very deep way. Huh? This is where it gets very, it comes back to the path again. This is no longer incidental to the path. This is no longer an addition that isn't required. This is a core aspect of the Buddhist path. And then with clairvoyance that is purified and superhuman, they see sentient beings passing away and being reborn, inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, in a good place and in a bad place. They understand how sentient beings are reborn according to their deeds, according to their kamma. This is the other very important insight that you can have as you practice the path. The seeing, understanding the law of kamma, how when you live well, you get reborn in a good place. When you live badly, you get reborn in a bad place. You understand the structure of samsara. You understand how samsara always works. Yeah, How you move from one existence to another one. And there is no way out because we're always making kamma. We're always moving on to something else. 
And this is kind of the problem with this kind of sansaric existence. I'm going through this quite fast because the purpose here is not to discuss all of these uh, high things. The purpose is really just to have a quick look at the benefits uh, of the mindfulness going to the body. So then we come to the last one there. Yeah, you realize the undefiled freedom of the heart, uh, the freedom by wisdom uh, in this very life. Uh, and they uh, live uh, having realized it with their own insight. Uh, due to the ending of the defilements. So this is the uh, becoming a arahant, yeah? When you reach the highest wisdom on the Noble Eightfold, on the noble eightfold Path, uh, and all the ending of the defilements, uh, and this too, uh, yeah? Becoming an arahant here is said to be one of the benefits uh, of contemplating the body here. Uh. So this is uh, very fascinating, yeah? And very interesting how far you can go with body contemplation. Of course, one of the most important aspects of this body contemplation is the mindfulness of breathing. So remember that the mindfulness of breathing is really core to this whole thing. And the sutta on the mindfulness of breathing, the Anapanasati Sutta, is uh, also takes you all the way to becoming an arahant. Yeah? So these are all very tied together. And Anapanasati, the mindfulness of breathing, is really the critical thing here that ties everything together and is the critical meditation practice that uh, uh, takes you all the way to the end of the path in this way. So the Buddha says uh, you can expect these 10 benefits uh, when mindfulness of the body has been cultivated, developed and practiced, uh, made a vehicle and basis, uh, kept up, consolidated, and properly implemented. That is what the Buddha said. Satisfied, the mendicants were happy with what the Buddha said. So that is the Kaya Gata Sati Sutta for you. Very beautiful, in many ways, very interesting Sutta. It's the first time I I teach this sutta on a retreat, so it's quite nice to be able to do it. And uh, uh, remember that uh, the main kind of um, emphasis of this sutta, and this is also the main emphasis you find in the Satipatthana Sutta, is that breath meditation is one of the core meditations that we should be dealing with. And secondly, if you find that you have some attachments to the body, some attachments that stop you from going very deep in your meditation, and the way to overcome that is to do a little bit of body contemplation. Yeah, 31 parts of the body, the four elements maybe specifically. And when you do that, then you are on the right track. Yeah? And also the idea of the mindfulness and clear comprehension, the situational awareness and the four postures. Uh, these are preliminary practices that lead you to be able to do mindfulness or breathing later on. Uh. Okay. So uh, there you are, uh, Sutta Nitti Tang. Sutta is finished. Uh, so I hope you are satisfied like the monastics were. 